it's so serene and peaceful here in the mornings at the North Polar Village. It almost feels like you're the only person in the entire world. But six to seven hundred years ago, this used to be the hunting ground of the Uluntun ethnic minority. And later on, it was a place where people would come to pan for gold. Nowadays, people come for a far different experience. Welcome to Travelog. I'm Michelle Lean. One and a half hours from Mohe Town is China's North Pole Village, known in Chinese as Beiji Chun or Beiji Village. It was originally called Mohe Village until, that is, in 2006, when the locals changed the name to one that capitalized on their greatest assets, their location at the most northerly tip of China, and being the only place in the country where you can see the northern lights. On first impression, Beiji Village, tucked away among the forest of the Danxing Anli, or Greater Xing'an Mountains region, looks like a sleepy place that is scarcely touched by the outside world. But the locals feel quite comfortable with the tourists who flock to their homes, curious about life in the northernmost village in China. Overlooking the Chita and Amur regions of Russia, Beiji Village has a history of over 150 years. However, due to the Great Fire of 1987, little remains of the past here. Walking around the village, I discovered that the homes, while modern, are made entirely of wood from the forest. In the past, this is what the houses in Beiji village would look like. The entire structure, including the gate and the main door, was made out of unprocessed logs. See here? You'd go through the main gate and get into another door, into the house. Oops, that's only really open. Well, that's as far as you can go. You know, you've got to keep some things private. And then right around here, that's where they used to keep the chickens. Most of the houses don't look like these this, these days because, you know, everything's modernized. But, you know, I think it's really nice that they have these models of the old houses as a reminder of what it used to be. Now, one of the things that most people worry about when they visit a village is the availability and state of the accommodation. I found many family-run hostels in the village that were both clean and offered tourists an experience of local life. But I was told that I should check out one in particular. Look at the room. It is so cozy. It's just entirely made out of timber and the best thing about it check this out is the view you get on one side you get the forest and on the other side you get Heilongjiang fantastic right and it's not even expensive it's about um, 200 kwai a night off season some say this is the best place to spot the northern lights but even without nature's spectacular light show, the unobstructed view of the Heilongjiang River and the Russian shore is unbeatable. Now, if you're going to spend a number of hours outside enjoying the view, come prepared. Even in the summer months, the temperatures here can drop drastically in the evenings, so the short sleeves that you can wear during the day won't keep you warm at night. This hostel was especially recommended because, quite uniquely, it rests on top of a restaurant opened by retired photographer Mr. Chin as a tribute to the Orichen ethnic minority and their culture. Mr. Chin spent many years photographing the Orichen people, and it was no surprise for me to discover that he had rescued two bear cubs from the forest and was raising them in his compounds, as bears are regarded by the Orichen people as their blood brothers. Yeah, that's right. You like that. Oh, hey. Hey. Come here. Oh. You get it? Mmm. You like my hand, don't you? Oh, you like it. <laughs> You're cute. 
这是我们鄂楞村现在唯一的在在世的，就是唯一存在这个一个老的萨满。这里头他拿手拿这个箭头呢，是我在前面挖掘基础的时候，嗯，哎，挖出这个十十七个古箭头，主要是鄂楞村最早打猎的时候，嗯，这么长的古箭头，大型兽骨，挖掘的时候经过文物部门鉴定，距今得有六七百年了。就说明鄂楞村人在六七百年就在北极村这一带打猎生活。The Orchen people call themselves the Riders of the Reindeer. They are one of the oldest ethnic groups in northeastern China and reside primarily in Inner Mongolia and along the Heilongjiang River. This nomadic hunting group once relied solely on the forest for their survival. Their food, medicine, and clothing all came from nature. While the Orchen people no longer practice their old ways. At Mr. Chin's restaurant, you'll be able to see the riding gear, household items, clothing, and hunting tools they once used. You 为什么对鄂伦村的民族有感兴趣？我在大学上大学时候实习，最早就接触鄂鄂伦村族的时候啊，嗯，是在八四年的时候，就感觉他不是大量的毁坏这个自自然，比如说他们这个鄂伦村这个这个民族，常年生活在大山岭里头，他们知道怎么去保护它。他们怎么知道有节制的保护动物？不是说大便就猎杀。这是鄂楞村狩猎归来这么一个场景。临时打猎居住这么一个盖的矬子，它大部分都是用呃袍子皮做的，大约五十多多多个袍子皮做一个围子。这一般是冬天用的。它主要是住的时候呢，它中间有个篝火，烤子。最关键它是睡的睡的是袍子皮的睡袋，穿着袍子衣穿着衣服。是皮呃皮，哎，睡的床也是皮，哎、是吗？呃，有有的有床，有的直接就可以睡到地下，哦，也可以睡到雪上。哦、关键它的底下的雪上，就是在雪这个雪地，嗯，它这个铺的那是刨皮，它是隔寒隔凉的。哦、嗯嗯，这是在这个马上直接鄂楞村打枪很准，在马上直接掏枪就能打住猎物。这张照片是在。打猎完以后，当天晚间回来再做这个狍子肉，喝酒。With Mr. Chen showing me pictures he'd taken of the Orchen people, I grew increasingly curious about their culture and asked him if I could find any Orchen people in North Pole Village. Apparently, a family lived nearby. He drew me a map to their home and pointed me in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After some searching, I finally found the place they were staying in, and thanks to the magic of mobile communication, they were already expecting me. Hello. 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 也挺长时间了。嗯。你教我一下鄂伦村话吧。嗯。行。啊，什么？你说阿布卡达。阿布卡达。阿布卡达比。阿布卡达。对啊。嗯。对啊。你看过这个北极光吗？看过。你什么时间看的懂吗？八几年的时候，八六年吧。嗯。下次那天。嗯。也就十点到十一点的时间。嗯嗯。就这个方向来的时候，那么大的光，完了到我们上班一下就扩散了。哎呀，那个亮亮的那个，哎呀，我说这是咋的呢？<笑>我说这是亮的那个，对，有一点害怕是吗？害怕了，我用那个大散布跟那蒙上了。<笑>对呀、啊，是吧？对、啊。我就蒙上了，怕这个，怕了挺长时间的。<笑>哎呀，我是不是？<laughs> Nowadays, the Orichen people no longer hunt in the forest. It's their way of protecting the wildlife. But they still hold on to most other aspects of their culture, including their style of dress and spoken language. Although most Orichen are also able to speak and write Mandarin now. <laughs> What happened?
happens is this bag here is used over winter and it's for keeping little things like knives and if they go hunting and they catch little animals and like you know rabbits and stuff they put it inside and then later on after they've eaten the meat they use the skin for example like this to make shoes and you know bags and various other little like trinkets the winter bag from the winter collection and the summer bag from the summer and spring collection. Yeah. You can't break this. This is like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She says, even if you use this for a hundred years and you tried pulling at it, it still wouldn't break. Yeah. In this weather, I was very impressed to see someone fishing in the Heilongjiang River. Few dare to brave the icy waters, preferring instead to line fish from the comforts of their boats. It turns out that Ligia catches fish from the river to feed to her guests at the family-run hostel. I noticed they were a little small, but there was no need to feel guilty, as she told me the fish in the river don't grow any bigger than this, and that I shouldn't judge them by their size, but by how tasty they are. that that usually she gets about half a basket worth but today the catch is a little sparse uh, I could really get used to living in a village. There's no question that all the food is organic and free-range because there's no alternative. There are no supermarkets in town and everything that is eaten is self-grown, so nothing goes to waste. If they can't finish the fish they catch, it's salted and dried for the winter. While most of us pay exorbitant prices for organic produce, the villages here live on a diet of free-range poultry, fresh vegetables, and fish. Oh. Hmm. Seems as though we city folk are getting the bad end of the stick. <laughs> wow, it's really humid in here. Oh, look. Do you see that? It's um, cilantro. Nice. I haven't spent much time on farms, so I was surprised to find that cucumbers have spikes. Yes, for those of you who already knew that, laugh away. Not easy. What surprises me is how easy it is to prepare the fish. Just give it a quick wash, mix it up with some salt, and stick it into the wok to deep fry. I'm a fan of deep fried anything, so I was definitely looking forward to this meal. Uh, Do you see the size of this fish? This is the size that of the fish that come out of the river. So they're all about this small. That's good. Let me see. You can eat the whole thing. It's a local delicacy here, and all the locals eat it. And they say that when the visitors come, they really like this dish. So if you come, you got to try this. Mmm. Even if it's deep fried, you can taste the freshness right from the river. <laughs> Prior to my trip, I'd read about Yinjing, who, after graduating with a degree in finance, decided to return home to Beiji Village and become an ordinary postal worker. That was 17 years ago, and in 2008, she was chosen to carry the Olympic torch through Harbin, capital of Heilongjiang province. So I head to the post office in the hope of meeting her. Hello. 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 Hello.
Unfortunately, when I arrived, Yinjing was out on her run, busy delivering mail to 3,000 households in Beijing. This despite the fact that she's been promoted to town postmaster. I decided to hang around and check out the most northerly post office in China. While it looks like most of the China post office around the country, I discovered that people also come here to get seals and special postcards made using any picture from their cameras. It can get pretty busy around here, so if you're not one for waiting, get up early. The post office opens at 8.30 a.m. Cool. Well, that's pretty good, actually. It's not every day that you come to the North Pole Village, so, you know, it's nice to take something home. And at the post office, well, see, you can make a little postcard and send it to whoever you want. Dear Mom. While I didn't get to meet Yinjing, I'm pretty sure that at some point she'll be sorting out my postcard along with the many others sent by tourists back to family and friends, all signed off with variations on with love from North Pole Village. Most people just, you know, take a spin around Heilongjiang River to get a look at, you know, Russia and China and both sides. But if you have the time, you should go right up to the head. Uh, Zooming up the Heilongjiang in a speedboat for one and a half hours to the head of the river won't be easy for those of you prone to motion sickness, but it's well worth the journey. Along the way, you'll see the Russian shore and get a glimpse of what appears to be some unguarded border posts. I can only assume that relations must be good with their neighbors in Beijing Village. I'm particularly lucky because my guide also happens to be the mayor of the village. This is the two bridges. The two bridges are connected. Then the river is called Heilongjiang. I find it hard to believe that I'm sitting in a boat at the point where the ninth longest river in the world begins. At this crossroad of rivers, I know that if I go upstream in one direction, I'll be traveling along the Argun River towards Mongolia, and in the other direction, the Shilka River will take me to Russia. While they are both great destinations, for now, I'm just happy to be cruising down the Heilongjiang. The幺三三是黑龙江源头的第一块，那么这面呢，代表着中国，就是我们设的碑。嗯，实际这个碑呢，应该设在河的中间。对，但是不可能。因为那个黑龙江是界江，一家一半，它不可能设在水中间，它只
，它这个有没有村庄？有，在里边一点我们看不到。嗯，哎，这附近这沟山沟里边一点有一个小村庄。嗯，可是他们你们他们他们不会有关系的是吗？嗯，做做朋友还是这样的。民、呃、间没有什么关系、哦，但是在这常住的居民和他那住的居民，嗯，经常到江边啊。那么由于年头多了，嗯、有的时候使望远镜一看，哦，他又来了，就是这么个认识。<笑>哦。In Beiji village, and especially in the tiny village of Logochun, you'll find that many of the elders look more European than Chinese. It's a result of mixed ancestry dating back to the gold rush of the 1860s. In this little village of 48 homes, everyone knows everyone else, and the mayor takes me to the home of one of his classmates, Mr. Huang, a Logochun villager with a Sino-Russian background. Uh, 它是供暖吗? 啊对,供暖 是吗? 一屋里都有暖 啊对对对 就跟咱们的暖气一样 它是属于空心墙 As I bid farewell to Mr. Huang, I wonder if you'll remember me the next time I come It's a pity so few people make the trip up to Luoguchun It may be a small village, but the people here have big hearts Most people come to Moha to see the northern lights. The best time for that is reckoned to be around the summer solstice. That's the 21st and 22nd of June. This is so exciting. I'm at the Northern Lights Festival, and it's an annual festival where everyone from all across China comes here just to watch the support photos and to join in all the activities. <laughs> Beijing Village may be a small place, but visitors from all over China travel here around the time of the summer solstice in hopes of seeing the northern lights. The airlines do increase the number of flights from Harbin to Moha during this period, but I still advise you to book your tickets early if you want to join the party. A private car from Moha to Beijing Village will cost you around 200 RMB. For me, fireworks tend to signify a beginning, be it New Year or the start of the Northern Lights Festival. It's still early, and judging by the array of fireworks being set off on the banks of the Heilongjiang, I get the feeling this party is only just starting. Younger visitors and locals party the night away to trashy techno music, hoping that if they stay awake long enough, they'll catch sight of the northern lights. After just two hours of night, dawn breaks, and once again, no sign of the northern lights. Perhaps the partygoers, all tucked up soundly in their beds right now, will be luckier tomorrow. You know, when most people come to Moha, they just want to be at the most northern tip of China, 
but there's a whole lot more to experience here, you know, from forestry to grasslands to just life by the river. It's a really surreal and true experience because it's here that you're closest to nature. I hope you enjoyed your journey with me to Moha. Thanks for watching Travlog. I'm Michelle Lean. I'll see you next time, but in the meantime, keep those bags packed.